Well, good morning. Uh, If you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 3. We'll pick up from there in a moment, Exodus 3. Uh, But I want to join in welcoming our visitors and welcoming everyone this morning. And seems like it uh, is uh, maybe a little more full this morning because I know we've got a lot of our uh, college students who are back home for the holidays. So it's good to have them home. I know uh, that makes families happy. Uh, And I know there's going to be a lot more of that in the, in the days to come and the weeks to come. And I hope that if you're traveling or if you have family traveling, that um, all that goes well and is safe. But it's good to be here this morning and to sing about the great I am, the great I am. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment. But I want to start with this. Uh, in just the year 2023, just this past summer, Uh, The Barna Research Group, which is one of the top research organizations in the world, came out with a study on what they call the open generation. The open generation, otherwise known as Gen Z. So from about uh, high school or early college on down to sort of teenage years, this is Gen Z. And what they found through this study, they asked questions like, how open are you to Uh, a supernatural worldview? What is your belief like in a God or some higher power? Or um, what do you think about the the spiritual realm? They asked questions like this, and the response was pretty interesting. Um, In an article that they published about this research, they have this to say, that though religious affiliation and church attendance continue to decline— Spiritual openness and curiosity are on the rise. Across every generation, in fact, we see an unprecedented desire to grow spiritually, a belief in a spiritual or supernatural dimension, and a belief in God or some higher power. That's really interesting. Um, If you were to go back 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the majority of the thought leaders would have Uh, not imagine that this up-and-coming generation would be more spiritually open. If anything, what they saw on the horizon was the eclipse of God entirely. That uh, atheism in a purely scientific, naturalist worldview would far surpass any belief in some supernatural idea. And so in the West, in Western society, in Western culture, the idea of God would fade more and more into the darkness. And yet, what this study reveals is that it's not so. In fact, across every generation, Gen Z to Boomer and Elder, the spiritual curiosity and belief in a God or at least some higher power is only on the rise. And here's what they have to add to it. The open generation, this study, indicates that young people especially may be fueling the rise in spiritual hunger. All right, so this is not the elder and boomer generation making some blowhorn call to come back to the faith. This is actually a young generation, Gen Z, hungering for something more, for something more than what's been promised by a purely naturalist worldview. And they found that Gen Z has the highest spiritual openness out of all six current generations, 74% moderately to highly spiritually open. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that they believe in the Christian God of the Bible, but again, they sense this hunger for some transcendent meaning that's beyond what's been promised to them by a materialist, secular worldview. And what's interesting is that the the 19th century philosophers saw this coming. While the scientists and maybe political leaders saw the eclipse of God, the the philosophers saw that this was going to happen. Philosophers like the well-known Friedrich Nietzsche, he is famous for having an, an essay on the death of God. And for him, that was not necessarily a triumphant thing. What he perceived, not being a Christian himself, the death of God by a materialist worldview, to say that there's nothing beyond what we can experience through our natural senses, 
what Nietzsche and other philosophers perceived is that that would create a massive vacuum of meaning. That it would spiral the world into a, a chaotic frenzy of trying to find purpose and value and ethics and identity and meaning. The crisis that we feel in our world today. And perhaps the theologian G.K. Chesterton said it best. Writing in the early 1900s, he says, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. And that, I think, is where we're at in our modern world. That when people stop believing in God, when they shut out the idea of a supernatural world, that there's a, a God above, this Christian worldview, it doesn't mean that people believe in nothing. They believe in anything. They search desperately to find something to hold on to, something in which they can find worth and meaning and value. They believe in anything. And so as atheism is fading in the West, people hunger for spiritual meaning. And they're not becoming any less religious. They're really just becoming religious about different things. Spiritual about different things. Searching for something, anything to believe in. And if that's true, if this is what we're facing with this next generation, the open generation, Gen Z, then perhaps the most important question over the next decade is not, is there a God, but rather, what's so great about our God? As people are, are more open to a supernatural worldview than ever before, as people are considering that there must be some God, some higher power, the question maybe is not, is there or is there not a God, but what's so great about our God? Or in the words of the song that we just sang this morning, what's so great about the great I am. What's so great about the great I am? And how would you answer that question? Maybe a few things come to mind, but maybe we can start with this. Uh, if you go to some uh, kind of party or event, uh, you might walk in the door and be handed one of these name tags, right? You grab a Sharpie and you write your name on it. And that's important because names are a way of identifying ourselves. They, they tell us something about who we are. Uh, for me, right, hello, my name is Jarrett. The, the word, my, my name Jarrett doesn't actually mean anything specifically. It's just, uh, I think my parents couldn't decide to name me Jared or Garrett, and so they just slapped the two together and came out with Jarrett. Not any real meaning in that, but my last name, this is just a fun fact, has nothing to do with the lesson. My last name, Ferguson, uh, it's Scottish, and it, it literally means son of the angry one. Uh, which is very descriptive of my character, as you can probably tell. Son of the angry one. Um, but names mean something. They're a way of identifying who we are, right? And did you know that God has a name? And maybe you think, well, of course, God has a name. His name's God. Um, but that's really more a title. Uh, or in Hebrew, it's Elohim, God. It's just it's really just a title, same with the word Lord or Adonai in Hebrew. Those are titles, but they're not God's name. But did you know that God has a personal covenantal name? And it's found right where you're turned to in your Bibles in Exodus chapter 3. And you remember the story, right? Moses, uh, he's been shepherding in uh, the wilderness for a number of years after he fled from Egypt and as he's making his way through uh, this mountainous area, all of a sudden he comes across, his eye catches this burning bush. And, and don't think some like small insignificant shrub. I mean, this is something that is a flame. It's a blaze. Um, in fact, it, I can't help but go here. It's, it's, it's actually supposed to be semblant of the, resemblant of the tree of life, if you want to make the hyperlink. But this is, this is, a massive, spectacular display of God's glory here in this burning bush. And Moses uh, goes over to it. The Lord interacts with him and he calls him. He says, I, I've heard the cries of my people and I'm going to come and I'm going to deliver them and I'm going to deliver them through you, the shepherd. 
And Moses is like, wait, 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 wait. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not so sure of myself. And he starts kind of making some excuses. But at some point, he comes to, to this. Um, Moses, he says to God, if, if I do this, right, if I go to the people of Israel and I say to them as they're enslaved in Egypt that the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me what is his name, what am I supposed to tell them? Right? That's a good question, right? Okay, if I show up on their doorstep saying, there's a God in heaven who's going to come and deliver you, they're going to say, well, what God is this? Because they live in a world full of idols, full of gods in Egypt. Who's, whose God is this? What's his name? What shall I say to them? And so the Lord responds to Moses saying, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So if God walked into an event, this would be his name tag, right? Hello, my name is I am. And maybe Moses was thinking, okay, great, thank you. That clarifies everything. I completely understand who you are now. Hello, my name is I am. Now, the question is, okay, well, what, what is that name mean? Well, uh, in our Bibles today, uh, I am is, is translated into, in, into Hebrew, or in Hebrew, it literally means uh, Yahweh, right? Uh, but in your Bibles, what you'll find is when you look through the Old Testament, you'll see over and over again, the capital L-O-R-D, the Lord. And what that means is it's not just emphasizing the greatness of, of God, it's, it's, a, it's a transliteration of uh, Yahweh, of the Lord. And the idea was that God is so good, God is so holy and pure and righteous that the Hebrew people thought we ought not even translate his name, and so they started translating it Adonai, the Lord. And then that got brought into our translations today as the capital L-O-R-D. And so every time you see that over, I think it's like 2,000 times, it's the I am, the I am. But what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of ways of thinking about that, the, the I am. Some people think that m maybe this has to do with God as the only non-contingent being, right? That he is the only self-dependent force in all the universe, that he is the I am, the creator and sustainer of life in whom and through whom and for whom all things exist. He's the infinite, almighty, eternal deity, and maybe that's what the I am is getting at, and I think that's part of it. But I think that the name I am is actually far more personal than that. And it's revealed to us in a story. And maybe one way of thinking about it is God says, I am who I am. But, but if you think about it, maybe we could turn it around to us. I am only sometimes who I am. Does that make sense? I am only sometimes good. I am only sometimes friendly. I am only sometimes selfless. Or maybe you experience this, say, like with a, with a roommate, right? Before you room together, you think, oh, this person is so giving and selfless and serving and easy to get along with. And you think, well, that's a pretty good roommate. But then maybe you move in with them and you realize, well, they're friendly and selfless, but they're not always friendly and selfless. And maybe they're good and kind, but they're not always good and kind. Because we are not always who we are. We're changing. And in, in, in whatever we are, we are not that fully and we are not that perfectly. But part of what's happening when the Lord says, I am, he's saying to Moses, whoever I am, whatever my character is, I am that perfectly and fully and eternally. I am who I am. And the question is, well, who is that? What is his character like? Who is the I am? And that's what I think the rest of Exodus is about. The book of Exodus, we often think of it as the, the redemption of God's people, but Exodus is not only about the redemption of God's people, it's ultimately about the revelation of God's name. 
It starts in Exodus 3 with, I am who I am, and it leaves the question wide open for the reader and for Moses and the people, well, who exactly is that? What is his character? What is his essence? What is his, his glory? And the rest of the book of Exodus is, is playing that story out. And so we see, I am the God who hears the cries of my people, Israel. I am the God who remembers and keeps his promises that I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am who thwarts and conquers the power of evil and oppression in Egypt. I am the the God who is superior and better than the idols that are around you. I am the God who parts the Red Sea so you can walk through. I am the God who leads you in the wilderness and provides for you with food and, and water in the desert. I am the God who brings you to this mountain and draws you into a covenant relationship. I am the God who renews that covenant even after it's been broken by the golden calf. I am the God who wants to come and dwell among you in this tabernacle. And I am the God who calls you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation so that I can continue to reveal my name through you. This is the story of who God is. This, God says, is who I am. The revelation of God's name. But the climax of this story comes in Exodus 34. And this is so powerful. Toward the end of this book, after this whole story of God slowly revealing to the people his character, his essence, who he is, Moses finally comes to this moment where he says, Lord, show me your glory. As he stands actually on the same mountain that God appeared to him in Exodus 3, he says, God, show me your glory. Show me who you are. Show me your essence. And so God says, okay, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I will allow my glory to pass on before you, and you'll catch a glimpse of my glory. And so it says in Exodus 34, beginning in verse 5, that the Lord descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord, of Yahweh. And he says, the Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, or I am, I am a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. So Moses, he's atop Mount Sinai, and he says, show me your glory, show me who you are, and the Lord responds with, I'm more than a light show. I'm more than just a glory cloud. I'm more than just my almighty, eternal power and and deity and majesty. I'm more than just that this is who I am. This is my, my character, my essence, my true glory. This is who I am. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The I am is not an impersonal force. The I am is is not just an abstract idea that humans have engineered throughout history. The I am is a personal and loving and relational God who desires a relationship with us. This God says to Moses, is who I am. The revelation of God's name. And the rest of the Bible story is really about that. The rest of the Bible story is God proving over and over again that this really is who he is. Over and over again, the prophets remind the people that when when they doubt God's intentions for them, whether he has their best interest in mind, when they question his character and his nature, when they seek idols and 
the comfort in dependence on other nations, when they feel that they have sinned so deeply that God would never call them back and invite them back into a covenant relationship, through all the ups and downs of Israel's journey, the prophets remind the people over and over again, this is what's so great about our God. This is what's so great about the great I am. This is who he is. Now, if, if someone kept doubting your character, if someone kept doubting your intentions and whether or not you had their best interest in mind, uh, you would probably kind of start to give up, right? If you spent your life pouring into someone trying to prove that you are gracious and compassionate and loving and faithful to them and forgiving of them and that you're going to hold them accountable and, and make them better, if you tried to prove that over and over again, but that was constantly rejected and rebelled against and pushed aside to where they doubt over and over again your character, eventually you'd probably say, okay, fine, I've wiped my hands, I'm stepping away, I'm done. But not the I am. And the question that is like resonating as the Old Testament closes is to what lengths will our God go to prove I am? To what lengths will God go to prove that this really is who he is? And that's when we come to, I believe, a fascinating passage in John chapter 18. John chapter 18. I know this is a a sharp pivot here, but hang with me. In John 18, Jesus has just finished the Passover meal, this Lord's Supper, with his disciples in the upper room. And it says that when Jesus had spoken these words, John 18 and verse 1, he went out with his disciples across the, the brook Kidron, where there was a garden. And you know this garden, right? It's, it's the garden of Gethsemane. And there Jesus, he comes with his disciples, and you know the story. He's there, and he's, he's weeping, and he's praying alone. Peter, James, and John, his closest friends, his inner circle, are struggling to, to not fall asleep, to be supportive, but they all seem to not be able to... to, to to handle what is happening in this moment. And so Jesus is there weeping and praying alone, praying to God, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me, yet not my will, but thy will be done. And as he prays there in the garden of Gethsemane, it says this, now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew of this place. He also knew about the garden, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, he went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, imagine this scene. Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he would have been able to see from that garden the gates of Jerusalem. And so from a long way off, he and his disciples can see this band of soldiers with lanterns and torches and weapons slowly making their way toward this garden, knowing where he is. And as Jesus sees this, as he knows what is about to happen, it says this, Jesus knowing all that would happen to him, what? Knowing all that would happen to him, fled knowing all that would happen to him, went back into Galilee in order to not be captured. No, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and he said to them, whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am. Now, maybe you think, whoa, time out. I, that's not what my translation says. My translation says, I am he. ESV, NIV, NASB, I am he. So what's going on here? Well, that's how our English translations put it. Uh, in the Greek, it's ego emi. Ego emi. 
literally, I am. And notice what happens when Jesus says, I am. The next verse, when Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back and they fell to the ground. What's going on there? They drew back and they fell to the ground. Now, maybe it's just they come up and Jesus says, hey, I'm the guy. And they're so startled that they just fall back to the ground. And in that sense, it's almost a comical scene. Here they come, this mighty strong band of soldiers to take this rabbi into custody. And Jesus just says, I am, and they fall back. Or maybe there was such power and authority in Jesus' voice that by some supernatural means, the breath of God that spoke the world into being falls, they fall back on the ground and and they can't recover. Whatever it was, here's the point I think John is trying to make. The point in John's gospel is that this is what happens anytime someone comes face to face with the I am. Haven't you seen that in scripture? Anytime someone comes before the I am, what do they do? They draw back and they fall to the ground. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter six, he sees the throne of the Lord, the glory, the Shekinah glory of God that's radiant and and, and splendorous and, and he falls on his face and he says, woe is me. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. When people encounter the I am, this is what happens. They draw back, and they fall to the ground. And John's point is whatever happened to the soldiers, whatever they fell to the ground, John is making a theological point that Jesus is the I am. And when the I am speaks, or when someone encounters the presence of the I am, this is what happens. They fall to the ground. Now, maybe you think, okay, I'm not not totally on board with that. Well, think back through John's gospel for a moment. Um, All throughout John's gospel, I am plays an essential role, right? There in John 8 and verse 58, a passage that was read for us a moment ago, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, they realized that this was more than a claim about Jesus' time traveling or something like that. They realized that this was a claim to deity. And they're so convinced by Jesus' claim, they're so convinced that, that he's making a claim to deity that they pick up stones to throw at him. And we see the same thing in John 6 and in, in, in verse 20. Uh, As Jesus, he walks along the sea in the midst of the storm, something that throughout Psalms and in the book of Job, only God can do. Only God walks on the sea. Only the I am walks on the surface of the waters. But Jesus, he comes to them and he says, I am. So do not be afraid. Or all throughout John's gospel, right? The I am statements. Right, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door to the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine over and over again. I am. And the point of John's gospel, one of the main points of John's gospel is this, that Jesus is the great I am who has come to dwell with us. And as he says in John 1, 14, that we, just as Moses saw the glory of God atop Mount Sinai, we have seen the glory of the Father full of grace and truth. The I am come to dwell with us. And the question is, well, what is the I am doing here? What's the I am doing here in John 18? What's the, what's the I am doing as one of his best friends betrays him. What is the I am doing as all his disciples in a moment are going to forsake him and flee? What is the I am doing as he's dragged before a a, a false court and wrongly accused and wrongly condemned? What is the I am doing as he is sped upon and mocked and whipped and beaten? What is the I am doing as he's led up Golgotha? What is the I am doing as he hangs on a cross. What is the I am doing here? 
And the answer to that question, I think, is in the next verse. In John 18, in in verse 7, it says this, that once more Jesus asked them, whom do you seek? And again, they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus answered again, I told you, I am. Therefore, if you seek me, then let these men go. Let them go and take me. Now think about that for a moment. Even though Jesus knew all that was about to happen to him, even though he knew that they would betray him and leave him and deny him, Jesus still came forward and said, let these men go and take me. And then he says this in verse nine. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. And then he quotes from John six in verse 39 that of those whom you gave me, I've lost not one of them, but I shall raise them up on the last day. Can you hear the gospel in this story? Um, Jesus Knowing that they were about to forsake him and flee and deny him, Jesus, he, he takes their death to give them life. He says, my life for yours. Here I am, take me, let them go. Take me, he says, take me. The I am says, take me. And here's, here's the point. Um, I am only sometimes who I am. Sometimes I'm good, but sometimes I'm bad. Uh, Sometimes I am humble. Other times I'm proud and arrogant and condescending. Sometimes I am just, and other times I don't stand up for the right thing. Sometimes I'm loving, and, and other times I'm hateful and resentful and bitter And in the Bible, this dichotomy of our character where we're back and forth and we're never who we are, that's called sin. But the good news is is that even when I'm not who I should be, the I am is still who he is. The I am is still merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And to prove who he really is, the great I am took on flesh. And he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Jesus came forward and he said, let these go and take me. And if I ever doubt that, if I ever doubt God's intentions for me, if I ever question his character, if I ever doubt that I can come back after I've wandered away, if I ever doubt who he is, I can look to the cross and I can behold the glory of God and I can hear God saying, just as he said to Moses, that this is who I am. And this is who I am for you. And so what's so great about the great I am Well, maybe we could say it this way. The I am became as we are so that we could forever live as he is. Isn't that a beautiful story? This is the story that we live in. This is the true story that we live in. The great I am became as we are, took on flesh, became a a, a person in a specific time and place and location in the garden of Gethsemane on a cross at Golgotha. He became as we are and experience the death that we experience so that we could forever live as he is. And so before we go, I think that means two really important things. And the first is this. Number one, the I am tells me who I am. I was listening to a a podcast recently called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. If you haven't Listen to it yet. It's, it's incredible. It came out a couple weeks ago with a, a guy named Justin Brierley, who's had some amazing conversations with uh, some very smart people over the past decade or so. 
And he hosts this podcast where they talk about sort of the rise and fall of new atheism and this emerging sort of open generation idea where people are more open than they ever have been to the transcendent, to the supernatural and spiritual world. And in this particular episode, um, they were talking about how in modern culture, we're often told to find meaning by looking within, by looking within the self, right? And this is kind of the the gospel of our culture. Everywhere you look, this is the anthem that is being raised. In fact, we see it in movies and media all the time. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free, Elsa from Frozen, right? This is the gospel of our culture. That I can be whoever I want to be. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free to create my own identity And in so doing, that is how I discover true meaning and value and purpose and worth. And while that might sound great, while that might sound liberating, here's the problem. The the problem is, as this podcast puts it, one of the hosts says, we live in a culture of relentless self-invention. And he says, this is in no small part behind the massive mental health epidemic that is especially plaguing our young people. Young people, they say, are cast loose into the world and being told to go and invent themselves. Do you hear how challenging that is? Do you hear the weight of that? Maybe it sounds great at first, this self-invention, but... But ultimately, the problem is that this is a depressively crushing and anxiety-inducing way of life. Why? Because the weight of my existence depends on whatever I make of it, whatever I can find within myself and project into the world. And the problem is that my identity is always changing. It's always in flux. I'm never who I really am, and and it's, it's confusing. And I feel the weight of that. I feel the pressure of that. And ultimately, people are finding themselves but they're not finding the meaning and the purpose and the value that was promised to go along with it. But the good news is that there's a better way. And that is to let the I am tell me who I am. I love the Christmas hymn that we sometimes sing, O Holy Night, long lay the world in sin and error pining. The idea that the world existed for for ages and we ourselves existed for a long period of time searching and striving to to prove the worth of this world's existence, of the, the worth of this universe and the worth of my own life and the meaning and value and purpose within it in sin and error pining until he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The I am appeared and the soul felt its worth. See, the good news is I don't have to go and prove my existence to myself or to the world or to anyone else. I don't have to invent myself and feel the pressure of that because the I am tells me who I am. And the I am tells me that I am made in his image with inherent dignity and value and worth The I am tells me that that even even though I am far worse than I ever dared imagine, I'm far more loved than I ever dared dream. And the I am tells me that I don't have to be defined by my past successes or failures. That's not the sum total of my existence. But I'm defined as a child of God, adopted into his family who belongs to him. So the question is, are you letting the I am define you? Are you letting the I am tell you who you are? But then the second thing is this. When I let the I am tell me who I am, the I am is revealed in me. This was God's promise at Mount Sinai, right? He invites the people into a covenant relationship and he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation of people for my treasured possession. In other words, God says, I'm, I'm going to reveal my name, right? That's what the whole book of Exodus is about. I'm going to reveal my name to the nations, to this world. I'm going to reveal who I really am, and I'm going to reveal my name through you. And this is what 
you were made for, right? To be the image of God. And while Jesus is the ultimate image of God who fully revealed God's glory and goodness to us, God wants to do the same through you and through me. And so in this open generation, in this open generation, as people are hungering for the spiritual, as people are more open to a supernatural worldview more than they ever have been before, searching for some God, some higher power, and they're asking the question, what's so great about your God? We can point to the Bible And we can point to the story of God, and we can point to the cross and say, this is who God is. But but here's what's so amazing to me, that in a world that's asking, what's so great about your God, the I am points to us. The I am points to us, the church, to you, and to me. And when the world looks, the hope is not that they would see how great I am, but that the world would see the great I am living in you and in me. This is who God is, the I am. We're about to sing an invitation song how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. And I believe that there's nothing that communicates that more than the story of the I am who took on flesh and died on a cross for us. And if you want to respond to that love this morning, if you want to step into the sphere of divine love of the God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and you want to experience that loving relationship with him this morning, however we can help, we hope that you'll make that known as we stand and as we sing.